It's um, a privilege and a joy to be with you guys. I know I say that every time, but I, I really, really mean it. I just so in, uh, enjoy uh, being uh, with you and worshiping with you, and uh, I always uh, look forward uh, to coming when I get a chance to be here. Um, this morning, I want to talk about the subject of the beauty of Jesus as the servant of all. So I invite you to turn with me uh, in your Bibles to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 7. John chapter 13, verse 7. And Jesus um, answered and said to him, to him being Peter, What I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Father, we ask you, Lord, for understanding. Lord, that you would uh, give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Father, open up our eyes by the Holy Spirit to your law to behold glorious and marvelous things concerning your Son. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. When Jesus uh, tells Peter, what I'm doing now, you don't understand, but you'll understand later, what he's referring to is what he's doing in John chapter 13, a passage that undoubtedly uh, many of you have read and come across. It's where Jesus is washing uh, the feet of his disciples. It's a passage that uh, has been um, an inspiration of many a weddings, you know, where uh, uh, the young man, he uh, gets on his knees and he washes his, uh, uh, the feet of his wife-to-be as a as a token of his commitment to, uh, to serve her all the days of his life. And whereas that is a noble application of the passage, I don't think that that is the, uh, 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 the main thing that is on Jesus' mind here in John chapter 13. And one of the reasons why I believe that is because of what he tells Peter. He says, Peter, what is happening right now, what I'm doing for you right now, it's not obvious to you. He goes, you don't, you don't get it quite get it right now, but you are going to understand this later. In other words, there are, there's layers of implications that, that is going to get unfolded um, uh, as the years go on, as the Holy Spirit gives insight to Peter and the apostles as to what exactly it is that Jesus was doing. And I believe that the same is true for us today, that, uh, that at first glance, we don't quite know what Jesus is doing, but the Holy Spirit wants to uh, give us insight and understanding to, uh, to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ as the servant of all. It probably, to me, is probably the most uh, uh, exhilarating topic about the glory of Jesus. It's, it's very surprising. It's, it's shocking. It's a, it's a bit overwhelming to, uh, to think of him not just as a humble God, but as a God who is, in fact, a servant at the very core of his being. Um, it is not only exhilarating, it's, it's troubling. Uh, when I uh, uh, teach this, this topic, and I've taught on this topic uh, several times over the years, and I cannot but help to experience this internal conflict on the inside because it just conflicts with everything in me of understanding of, um, of authority to go that, to, to think of one so high and one so powerful, one so beautiful, one so intelligent would see himself as a servant of his own creation. I mean, that, that to me is absolutely mind-boggling. And then secondly, it is troubling because if this is true about him, then where does that leave me? That if the, if the Messiah, if the King of kings, the, the Lord of glory, if he is profoundly humble at the very core of his being, then where does it leave us as his people who are uh, invited as well as commanded to be formed into the image of his likeness by the Holy Spirit. And so I just want to invite us that uh, as we're looking at the subject to, uh, to be like the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 verse 10, Paul talks about this group of believers in Berea and it says that they were more noble, they were of noble character, they were noble minded because they were committed to to searching out the scriptures on a regular basis to see if the things that Paul was saying is true. And I want to invite us to do the same, to, to search out the scripture to see 
if indeed if it is indeed true that Jesus Christ is not just simply humble, but that God himself, the uncreated God, is indeed a servant, and he is our servant. He is the servant of all. And so this morning, my goal is to not um, give uh, too much practicals about the issue of servant and humility, though there is a place for that, but rather I would like to paint a picture um, uh, before us this morning uh, according to the scripture and to say, look, this is what the scripture tells us about the nature and the character of God. It is actually uh, quite amazing what we find out in the scripture about who God is. It, it challenges us. It, it draws us to him. It causes us to marvel. It tenderizes us. It challenges us when we see what the scripture says about the truth of God. Now, the, the fullness of Christ is manifested in his love. The, 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 when the scripture talks about the fullness of Christ, it is talking about the full manifestation of his love. In John chapter 13, verse 1, at the very beginning of the chapter, John uh, writes, Now before the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from the world to the Father, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. The New, America, the New International Version says that he showed them the full extent of his love. And which is interesting that here, John, is about, he knows he's about to write about what happened at the supper table as Jesus was washing his disciples' feet. And John's testimony, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he says that what Jesus is doing here, he is displaying the full extent of his love. He is displaying the length to which he has gone and the length to which he will go for love insofar as loving his people. And so that already should give us a tip-off that John chapter 13 of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples is more than him simply giving an example of how we need to wash each other's feet. No, but rather he is, he is thundering, as it were. He is shouting by way of a prophetic act, saying, this is who I am. I, the God of glory, am the God of all humility. I am the servant of all. The greatest expression of godliness is to live in love. You know, when we, we can sum up godly living in one word, love, loving the way that God calls us to love, or holiness. Holiness and love are synonymous, and we can add to that uh, meekness and servanthood. These are all um, interchangeable terms that you and I are called to deep and profound humility. Now, the problem with humility is, I don't know about you, but that doesn't come naturally. Like, I didn't come out of my mother's womb and go, wow, look at this humble creature that God gave me. That is, you know, that is not how I came forth, you know, all those years ago. That is not something that is natural to us to be humble. We don't naturally think humble. We don't naturally feel humble. We don't naturally do humble things. Now, by humility, I don't just simply mean the willingness or the ability to do menial tasks. Uh, the, the, the willingness and the ability to do menial tasks is an expression of humility, but humility is as much as an inward disposition as it is an outward act. It is as much to do with the, the way that we think about ourselves and the way that we think about others. So, you know, uh, Paul tells the church of Philippi, he says to, that we are to arm ourselves with arm ourselves with the same attitude of Christ Jesus, that, there, that humility is as much of an inward reality as much as it is an outward expression. And so the way that we think about others, the way that we think about the opposite sex, the way that we um, entertain thoughts of purity in the way that we think about the opposite sex is a profound act of humility because it is a reflection of the way that we see their value, the way that we see our value, the way that we see the glory of God, and so forth. So when talking about humility, we're not just talking about just kind of slumping down and kind of have your head down. No, we're talking about this inward thing, this inward uh, conversation, the, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit inside of us, and that can only happen by grace. And so that's why uh, putting this picture, this vision of, uh, of Jesus' glory as a servant of all is so important because 
Because the only way that you and I can be transformed into the likeness of God is by interacting with him, is by beholding him. In, um, uh, uh, it's called the beholding and becoming principle that whatever we behold about God's heart is what we become in ours. Whatever we behold about God's personality, that becomes a part of our personality as well or our character. And the, the revelation of Jesus' meekness, what it does, it produces a longing in us to become just like him. That when we see him like this in the scripture, the Lord begins to touch us and go, Lord, I, I want to be like this. I, I want to be like you in this way, the way that you've modeled and the way that I see it within the word of God. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, he says, But we all beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. And so again, instead of beholding, we can say um, interacting. Instead of interacting, we can say meditating or as I know that Pastor Ron has taught about this, the pray reading the scripture. So it's interacting with the Lord based upon an aspect of his character or his attributes, in this case, a servanthood, that when we begin to interact with the Lord, the, uh, 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 we, get, we get transformed into, the same, into that same image from glory to glory, Paul tells us. The subject of the humility of Jesus, the servanthood, when Jesus described himself, he named himself um, on various occasions in the scripture as the Son of Man, uh, the Bread of Life, and so forth, but the only time when he actually describes himself um, is in uh, Matthew 11, verse 29. He says, learn from me, for I am gentle and I am lowly at heart. I'm gentle and I'm lowly at heart. And beloved, that is the uh, Jesus' decoration about himself, not just yesterday. That is his decoration of himself today, and it is the decoration of himself forever and tomorrow. Now, in John chapter 13, verses 3 and 4, the, the passage continues. And what we see there is Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and that he was going to God. He rose from the supper and he laid aside his garment, took a towel, and he girded himself. Now, remember earlier I mentioned that Jesus is displaying something. He is prophesying something. He is actually doing something that is very much uh, uh, in keeping with what the prophets did in the Old Testament, where they would act out um, uh, the word of the Lord. And my favorite one of that is, is Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a mimester. You know, for the first 24 chapters of the book of Ezekiel, he's actually acting out Instead of saying what God is, is saying, he acts out what God is saying. And, and in Jesus, I believe, is doing the same thing. He is a prophet, yea, more than a prophet. He is the Son of God, and, uh, and he, is, he is acting out, I believe, revealing um, uh, uh, the, the, the very nature and the character of God as the servant of all. And so here, Jesus, being fully aware of who he is, Knowing that all authority in heaven and on earth was given to him, he understands that everything had been given to him by his father, number one. Number two, he knows that he had come from God, and so he knows that he is God. And thirdly, he knows that he's going to God. And with this awareness, it says in verse 4, that with that awareness, he rises up from the supper table, lays aside his garment, takes on a towel, and he girds himself. And so it is not a display of the denying of who he is, but rather Jesus embracing who he is. It is the very source out of which he then is motivated to serve, uh, uh, to, uh, to serve his friends. The reason why this is important is because when we're talking about humility, we're not talking about denying who you are. We're not talking about denying that you're even good at something. We're not talking about denying that you're gifted. It's like this story of this pastor who was a phenomenal a keyboard player who uh, played, uh, 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 he played the keyboard for the special on a Sunday morning. And after the service, uh, an old lady walked up to him and said, Sonny boy, he says, that is some of the best piano playing I've heard in my life. And he says, oh, no, it was just the Lord. She's like, well, it wasn't that good. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and he could have just simply said, thank you, you know. And it, there's nothing wrong with saying thank you, that you know, the Lord has given me a gift. Thank you very much. Thank you for the feedback. Thank you for the encouragement. In other words, 
uh, 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 humility, again, it's not denying who you are. I mean, can you imagine Jesus when, he, when, uh, when Peter tells him, he says, he says, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Can you imagine Jesus going, well, I mean, I mean, this, I mean stop it, right? Just stop it, right? I mean, it's not a big a deal. I mean, come on, man. You, 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 now, you, Peter, on the other hand, you the man. I mean, that's not what is going on over here. You know, he says, yeah, I am the Christ, you know, what's the, you know? And so he doesn't deny who he is. In fact, later on in, in verse 12, he says, if I, the Christ, if I, your teacher, am doing this, then do likewise. And so again, the issue of humility is not laying aside, it's not uh, uh, denying who we are, but rather it is the embracing who God says that we are according to the scripture. True humility actually is a display of confidence, not a display of insecurity. Now what I think Jesus is doing here, as I mentioned earlier, he is prophesying, he's acting something out, a... Um, uh, 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 a picture's worth a thousand words, and so Jesus, what I think is doing, when he gets up from the table, and when he takes off this outer garment, I believe he's saying, look, he goes, I am the God of glory who's clothed in light. I dwell in light on approach, but I'm laying aside my glory, and I'm clothing myself with a garment of flesh or the towel that he put around the, uh, around the waist. Now here in Psalm 104, it says that he clothed himself with light as a garment, that the God who's clothed himself with the light as a garment is the same God who now clothed himself with the garment of flesh. And beloved, that is a part of what the Christmas story is all about, that one so high, one so lofty, one so glorious, magnificent, transcendent in his greatness, that you know, it says in 1 Kings 8.27, it says that the heavens of heavens cannot contain him. And that in itself presents a real philosophical problem. That the heavens cannot contain God, 1 Kings 8.27 says. And, and think about this. That here is the God who the very heavens cannot contain. It says that he inhabits eternity in, in Isaiah 59. This one decided to make the womb of a young Jewish girl his dwelling place for nine months. That is absolutely mind-blowing, you know, and, and we need our minds blown. We need... Um, our vision of God enlarged. Uh, it's like the old song said back in the 90s, I have made you too small in my eyes, oh Lord, forgive me. We need the Holy Spirit to, uh, to help us enlarge our vision of the grandeur and the majesty and the splendor of who God is. But the thing that is so mind-boggling is not that he's so transcendent. I mean, at least we can go, well, he's God that makes sense, but that the one that is so great in all of his glory, the beloved, that he became a zygote. That is like, what in the world? Because the incarnation, when the word became flesh, he did not become flesh at birth. He became flesh nine months before the birth and dwelled among us. He didn't start dwelling among us when he came out of Mary's womb. He was dwelling among us the moment that she was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Beloved, that is mind-blowing. And no wonder the psalmist says in Psalm 113, he says, Who is like the Lord, who humbles himself to behold the things in heaven and the things that are on the earth? Several times the Old Testament says that phrase, Who is like the Lord? In other words, who are you? Who, who does this? You know, who is so powerful? Who is so beautiful, who is so wealthy, who is so intelligent, who has so much authority that he would so lower himself to become a zygote, to become, a, 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 to make the dwelling place of a Jew, uh, to make the womb of a Jewish girl his dwelling place for nine months. That is staggering. Beloved, it is on that point alone, if I may say this, it is on that point alone that the God of Israel is not like the God of Islam. Who is like him? There is no God like him. 
as the psalmist says, who humbles himself, and I love this, he humbles himself to behold the things in heaven. In other words, when God <laughs> began to sit upon the throne of glory in heaven and the myriads of angels, it says 10,000 times 10,000 angels, they are worshiping him and the four living creatures day and night and night and day. Holy, 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 the scripture says that him sitting there is an act of humility. He is a humble God. He is the servant of all. Isaiah chapter 49 to 55 covers the most depth of the subject of the servanthood of God. And for those of you who want to just kind of dive into the subject a bit more, Isaiah 49 to 55, those six chapters uh, uh, cover uh, uh, with tremendous eloquence and insight and just, wow, just the glory of Jesus as our servant. But here's what's, uh, here's what's important. Is that Isaiah, several chapters before, in Isaiah chapter 6, it says that he saw the Lord high lifted up and the train of his robe is filling his temple. And what Isaiah does not expect is what he's about to discover several chapters later, that this one who is high and lofty, the angels are around his throne. They're singing, holy, holy, holy. It says, that they are, it says that they are seraphim. In other words, they are burning ones is what that word means. They are these angelic burning torches. They are around God's throne, and they are singing day and night. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I mean, they're singing this day and night, night and day. And then Isaiah gets the shock of his life in Isaiah 49 to 55 that this one who is so glorious in his power and his splendor is a servant. He is the servant of all. And Israel stumbled over this when he came as a man, the son of man. And when he began saying things like, look, he goes, I didn't come to be served, but, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. The prophet Isaiah, he declares that at the very core and at the very essence of the Godhead lays the issue of meekness. He is meek and lowly at heart. In John chapter 13, verse 5, Jesus goes on, uh, John goes on to say that after that, talking about Jesus, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now, beloved, that was the most holy, scandalous, outrageous thing he could have done at that particular moment because in those days, it was only not just the slave, it was the lowest of slaves that gave themselves to washing the feet of the guests that would come to their master's house. And here Jesus, this uh, the one who knows that the Father had given everything to him, the one who knows that he is God, and the one who knows that in his, uh, uh, in his uh, humanity he's going back to God, he does this act of the lowest of slaves. He is displaying, he's revealing uh, to his disciples uh, the very nature of him as the servant of all. And, and really, as we look at the life and the ministry of the apostles later on, we see that they are seeking to emulate this in their life and their ministry, that as apostles, they need to walk in humility and in servanthood to the people of God. When Jesus came on the scene 2,000 years ago, he came as a servant. But he also came revealing the very nature of God, God's glory, as a servant. In other words, he didn't just come to be a servant for you know, 30 to 33 years. No, he came as a servant, yes, but he came to reveal that from before the foundations of the earth, at the very core of the Godhead, that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit lies, at the very core they're being, that they're humble, that they are servants. That's the way they relate with one another. And Jesus came to reveal this. It says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, that that he is the brightness of his glory. He is the express image of his person. You know, Jesus even told Philip, he said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. 
And so here, as Jesus is on his knees doing the work of the lowest of slaves, he is washing his disciples' feet. Philip is beholding the Father because that is what the Father is doing. He is a humble God. A God being servant doesn't mean that he suspends other aspects of his personality in order to manifest his humility. And so, when, so he is a king, but when he manifests his kingships as the ruler of the nations, he is a servant. When he is the judge who judges the nations, uh, when we stand before him at a judgment seat in that great day when we meet him face to face, he, at the very core of his being, is a servant. Um, when he reveals himself as the bridegroom, he is our servant. It's who he is at the very core of his being. He doesn't suspend one attribute to exercise another, as A.W. Tozer says. The angels around the throne, they are overwhelmed by this truth as they worship him day and night, night and day, the glory of him. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus said, look, you don't understand what I'm doing now. He says, but you will, but you will understand this later. Um, in Luke chapter 12, verse 35 to 37, Jesus uh, gives a parable uh, to his disciples about his second coming. And um, look what he says in verse 35. He says, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, knocks they may open to him immediately. Verse 37 is, the, is just the wow. He says, blessed are those servants whom the master, referring really to himself, when he comes, it's referring to the second coming, that he will find them watching or he will find them waiting. He says this, assuredly. In other words, it's truly, truly. He goes, this is absolutely the truth, Jesus says. I say to you that he will gird himself. I mean, it's just like he did at the table in John 13, 4. He gets up, takes off the outer garment, puts on the towel. He girds himself. It says he will gird himself and he will have them sit down and he will come and he will serve them. Beloved, what, what is going on? Not only did he come to serve the first time, he comes back the second time to serve as well. Because it's who he is at the very core of his being. Now, some of you are about to have a conniption fit on me over here. I understand because I'm having one right now just saying it. But we're in good company because Peter had a reaction to this. Peter had a profound reaction to this in verse 7. He says, and Jesus answered and said to him, he goes, what I'm doing now you don't understand, but you will understand after this. And Peter goes, you shall never wash my feet. It's like, Peter, do you know who you're talking to? I mean, think of the boldness to look at God. You will never, it's like, wow, it's like easy, man. It's like, hey, slow down. I mean, he, he is not ignorant as to who it is that is washing his feet. In fact, it is because of his, uh, 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 because of his understanding of who Jesus is, is why he's troubled. Remember, he's the one who said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And Peter understands this, and so to see the king of the ages bend his knees in front of Peter to wash his feet to do the work of a slave. Peter goes, never, you will never do this. And Jesus, with the tenderness that only he knows how, I'm sure, I'm sure he, was t I'm sure he had a smile on his face. There was a twinkle in his eye. He looked at Peter. He goes, oh, Peter. He goes, if I do not wash you, you can't have any part of me. In other words, Peter, the only way I will be your king is if you receive me as your servant. The only way I will be your king, Peter, is if you receive me as your servant. Let's give a little more of a contemporary example of this. 
imagine you're going home this afternoon and, or this morning and you're sitting at home and with your family, you take a nap or whatever, and imagine Jesus appears to you in all, your, in all of his glory. But first of all, that would be like totally terrifying. And if that were to happen to me, after I'm done freaking out, my initial reaction probably would be, Lord, what must I do for you? And I imagine him going, no, 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 just stay right where you're at. Where's your trash can? Where's my trash can? <laughs> yeah, I've come to take out your trash. But you're the, glor you're the Lord of glory. I would imagine him saying, yes, but I'm the servant of all. Beloved, if we cannot imagine Jesus in all of his glory taking out our trash, I want to submit we may not know the Jesus of the Bible. Because the Jesus of the Bible did the work of the lowest of slaves when he washed his disciples' feet. If the nations of the earth don't allow Jesus to be their servant, they cannot be a part of him. The only way he will be our king is if we let him be our servant. Jesus said that you don't understand now what I'm doing, but you'll understand this later. And Isaiah chapter 49 verse 7 probably gives my favorite uh, a title of Jesus Christ. It's the most like, the one that puts my mind and my heart most on tilt, like, huh. Isaiah 49 verse 7, it says, thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, the Holy One, to him whom man despises, he's saying this to Jesus, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nations abhor or the nations hate. Here it is. He says, to the servant of rulers. Who is like him? In Revelation chapter 1 verse 5, Jesus is called the, the ruler of the kings of the earth. And Isaiah says, well, I have, I have the other side of the same coin. Yes, he's the ruler of the kings of the earth, but he's also the servant of rulers. And when Jesus comes back, he comes back insisting on a culture of humility in all the spheres of the nations of the earth. He's coming back to establish the, the fullness of his father's glory, which at the very essence is his humility. And those who lift up their heads in pride, they will be crushed by the very weight of his humble glory. Because he insists on humility. He insists that the very culture that exists in the relationship between his Father and his Son and the Holy Spirit, that that culture would exist in the lives of the redeemed. And when he comes to fill the earth with his Father's glory, I assure you he's filling the earth with the servanthood and the humility of the Godhead forever. One of the prayers that um, I pray, and I encourage you to pray the same prayer, and again, this might be troubling. It still troubles me all these years later, but something in my heart goes, Lord, I got to get this. And the prayer goes like this, Lord, will you come and serve me? Lord, will you come and serve me? And boy, I tell you, that is the, 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 if there's a Peter in you, it will come out when you pray that prayer. But I'll soften the blow a little bit and say it this way. Lord, will you come and minister to me? Now, how many are familiar with that phrase? Lord, would you minister? Now, the word minister and serve, they mean the same thing. In other words, you've been saying it for years. You just never thought of it as serving. Lord, will you come and serve us? Father, we come before you. Father, it, it humbles us. It troubles us. It moves us to think of you as the humble one, the servant of all, the God of glory. Your son is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's a servant of rulers. Father, I ask you this morning for marriages. I pray for those who are in financial need, those who are in turmoil, Father, would you serve them this morning by your spirit? Would you visit your people? Oh, humble one, you who behold the things in the heavens and the things on the earth, 
Would you behold your people this morning? We ask you for your humble glory to touch our marriages. We ask you for your humble glory to touch our families. We ask you for your humble glory to touch our finances, to touch our bodies, to touch our emotions, to where there is anxiety that you would bring peace and joy and you would calm the storm. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.